At this point of the growing season, our attention shifts from seeding and planting to watering and fertilizing. And of course, some harvesting. With record setting heat waves, drought, and challenging conditions all around, it's the smallest tips and tricks that can make the difference in our gardens. It's hard to believe, but we're 90 installments into this garden quickie journey. And these last 10 videos have proven to be very timely. So in case you missed it, here's episodes 81 to 90. Enjoy. Nothing beats a fresh pea out of the garden right off the vine. Traditional English peas, snow peas, and sugar snap peas, all tasty in their own way. If you've ever grown peas before, you know just how prolific they are. Couple that with peas being a legume, which are known to fix their own nitrogen right out of the soil. One wonders if peas need anything from us at all. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we solve all the hard questions of gardening. And today's episode is all about fertilizing your pea plants. Or rather, do we even need to? Time short as always, so let's get into it. Known botanically as Peasum sativum, peas are legumes grown for their lush green seeds, those nice crunchy edible pea pods, or both. And as a legume, peas have the ability to fix atmospheric nitrogen using a special relationship between bacteria and their roots. This has led people to believe that peas don't ever need fertilizer. And while this may be true in some cases, it's not due to the fact that peas have the ability to grab a little bit of nitrogen for themselves. Nitrogen is but one macronutrient. Sure, it's a very important one, but it's still just a single nutrient responsible mostly for leafy growth. If we were just growing peas for their leaves, that'd be great, but obviously we're not. The main crop of a pea plant is a direct result of its flowering cycle. And while nitrogen does play a part in this cycle, it takes a backseat to phosphorus and possibly even potassium. Further to that, it's the host of secondary and other trace nutrients that really define the vigor and flavor of the pods and peas. So while nitrogen is important for these pea plants here, as it is for all my crops, it alone is not going to get me that mega pea harvest that I'm after. Now, having said that, peas grow fast. 60 days or less for some varieties. Couple this with them being one of the first crops in your garden, they have dibs on the soil when it's at its most fertile. This and this alone is why we can sometimes get away with not fertilizing our peas. For me, to get that max harvest, I'll give my pea plants two extremely weak feedings of a low dose, low nitrogen organic fertilizer. Once about three weeks after germination, and then again another three weeks after that, but not too close to harvest time. It's not always necessary, but a slight boost really can max out your yields and have your pea plants performing at their peak. Know what else is going to get your garden performing at its peak? Watching the next episode of The Garden Quickie. A healthy garden is buzzing with them. Busily going about their work, undaunted by the fact that the whole system rests on their shoulders. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we give credit where credit is due. And today, we're talking about pollinators. More specifically, the importance of them. I've got three reasons that we need pollinators in our garden. Time short as always, so let's get into it. Pollinators are simply animals that move pollen from the male parts of the flower, the anther, to the female part of the flower, the stigma. They come in many shapes and sizes, with the most recognizable one being bees. But what makes pollinators so important? Why do we care about them? Well, for one, Without the pollination and fertilization of our crop's flowers, many of them 
would just not produce. Yes, some crops can actually self-pollinate, like these tomatoes here, while others have their pollination aided by wind and gravity, such as my corn. But a lot of our crops cannot do it by themselves. Of the roughly 1,400 food crop plants grown worldwide, 80% of them require pollination. No pollinators, no food. Another benefit of pollinators is in making viable seed. Even in crops where we're not harvesting the fruit of a flower, such as these green onions here, we still need pollinators to get proper and viable seed. If you're going through the process of saving your own seeds, like I do every year, pollinators are simply invaluable. And lastly, we need pollinators for the entire ecosystem, both inside our garden and out. The world's flowering and seed producing plants rely on this pollination cycle to maintain the genetic and biodiversity that we don't often think of. The way that it's evolved and set itself up, the planet's terrestrial ecosystems as we know it simply wouldn't survive without these pollinators. Know what else is needed to survive? More episodes of the Garden Quickie. Even though it's the longest crop you'll ever grow by far, the harvest starts and it's over in an instant. Garlic. That enigma of a plant growing just below the surface, testing the patience of even the most veteran grower. And test it does. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Right Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garlic, I mean Garden Quickie. The show where in two minutes or less, we show you all the best gardening tricks. And today's episode is all about garlic harvesting. Or more accurately, garlic harvesting tips. I've got three to share with you today. Time short as always, so let's get into it. With harvesting your own garlic, it's all about the timing. But you can't actually see the crop. You can't see those heads of cloves growing below the ground. So how then do garlic growers know when it is time to harvest? Well, it's all about the leaves. The best heads of garlic come from the worst looking plants. Like their cousin the onion, garlic leaves start to fail one by one just as the crop is maturing. You see, these allium plants are amazing. The garlic bulb itself is just a cluster of modified leaves, and the last few leaves on the plant make up the protective papery layers. So, when you're finding that a half or more of your garlic leaves are starting to dry out and turn brown, it's likely time to harvest. Knowing this, and knowing what to look for, you can kind of see the harvest coming a few weeks in advance. Every few days or so, another set of leaves starts to deteriorate. So about one to two weeks before you predict you're going to be harvesting that garlic, you need to put the watering can away. If the soil is too moist at harvest, you can get bulb rot. Not to mention, it makes the curing process infinitely harder. Stop the watering, even if the weather's warm. And our last tip is about digging up the bulbs, and I do mean digging. The garlic stems, although they seem tough, they're not handles for ripping the bulbs out of the ground. Those bulbs need to be loosened with a trowel or fork, carefully and methodically. Damaged bulbs are perfectly edible, but they're not going to be able to be stored. Work around the base of that plant with a small shovel or even just your hands, and eventually that garlic bulb is going to loosen up and break free. Nothing better than being self-sufficient and harvesting your own garlic. Nothing except maybe the next episode of the Garden Quickie. All higher plants do it, and it's the number one reason we even get a harvest in the first place. Flowering is the number one method of reproduction, allowing our crops to give us a harvest. Without it, there's no strawberries, no tomatoes, no peppers, and no peas. And definitely none of these zucchinis. So why does bolting get such a bad rap? Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we separate the good from the bad. 
And today's episode is all about bolting. Or more specifically, why do we try so hard to avoid it sometimes, while other times it's completely necessary? Hey, time is short, as you know, so let's get bolting. Bolting is simply flowering. That's it. Well, sort of. More accurately, bolting refers to plants where vegetative growth and the foliage is the desired crop, and the flowering or going to seed puts a stop to it. Examples would be basil, lettuce, green onions, and even this Swiss chard. The first thing to realize is that bolting in non-fruiting crops is bad for us, not the plants. For these crops, such as this cilantro, it's a perfectly normal, natural part of their life cycle. They have to do it to reproduce. But I don't want 10,000 little baby chard seedlings to sprout up in the fall when these guys drop naturally. Fine then, I can just cut the seed head off, problem solved, right? No, not really. The act of bolting spells the end of the plant as an edible crop, and it does this in two ways. Flowering is a massive drain on the plant. It puts all of the energy into making that fruit, going to seed, and those lush leaves that we harvested like mad in the spring turn into rubbery shadows of their former selves. And on top of that, the taste changes, and not for the better. Once bolting sets in, the crop goes bitter and not nearly as tasty at best, completely inedible at worst. Like we said, bolting is a part of the natural life cycle, and it's going to happen on its own eventually. But that's okay. It's just the early sudden bolting that we want to avoid here. And that happens by heat, moisture, and light stress. You see, sudden bolting is almost always caused by environmental stress. Increased temperatures, less moisture, and more light hours are direct clues for the plants to reproduce. Their best days are behind them, they gotta get that seed out there. It's why bolting happens almost exclusively in the summer. And when it happens, unless you're specifically after that seed, that's unfortunately the end of the line. Know what isn't the end of the line though? These green onion seeds and the next episode of The Garden Quickie. For the most part, our crops are a harmonious bunch, working side by side for the greater good. Taking turns catching the rays and joining network forces down below to grab moisture and nutrients more efficiently. It sounds like some sort of utopia, right? Well, for the most part, it is. But not everyone plays nice, and not everyone shares the wealth. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we try our hardest to keep the peace. And today is all about zucchinis. Or, more accurately, why they make such terrible companion plants. All squash, really, not just zucchinis. I got three reasons why today, time short as always, so let's get into it. Edible squash crops, zucchini in particular, are massively productive plants. Endless harvest after endless harvest, as long as the summer continues. But to produce that level of produce, they need a lot of inputs. A lot of water, a lot of nutrients, and a lot of light. With their oversized leaves and highly efficient root and cell systems, zucchinis are very adept at grabbing these things. They'll quickly take over an area, and even traditional one-foot spacing is hilariously inadequate. And while the zucchini plants are hogging to themselves all that water, all those nutrients, and all the space, they're also inviting some unwanted guests. Soft-bodied insects like aphids simply love zucchini plants. The quick, lush growth seems to really attract them in spades, and while your zucchinis are tough and rarely affected by such sap-sucking nuisances, the neighboring plants might not be. And finally, 
After using up nearly all the resources, as well as bringing in a bunch of unwanted guests, zucchinis and squash contribute something much worse. If you've ever grown zucchinis or any squash before, you've likely dealt with it, if not at least been warned about it. But this group of plants is highly susceptible to powdery mildew. It just follows this family of plants around like no other, and it can jump to other crops around it that aren't normally affected. Crops such as peas, tomatoes, and even your strawberries. Zucchinis, where the best solution is single and solitary. Unlike the next episode of the Garden Quickie, where everyone's invited. See you soon. Blueberries, a North American superfood with no equal. Born on perennial bushes that are both hardy and easy to grow, this berry seems to be a staple of so many temperate growers. And rightly so. These little bushes are as prolific as they are undemanding. But like all tasty things, we just can't get enough. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we pump up all your harvests. And today's episode is all about our beloved blueberries. Or more accurately, how to get the jumbo size ones. I've got three ways to pump up your blueberries to max size this year. Time short as always, so let's dive in. Like with any crop, to max out that harvest, the plants need the right conditions. And for blueberries, they're quite specific in their needs. To grow the best fruit, Blueberries need full sun, moist organic rich soil, good drainage, no competition from weeds or other plants, and a fairly acidic soil. They're a bit of an odd one with that, needing a pH of 4 or 5, which is quite unlike our other crops. Moving on to the second way to max out your blueberry size, is to plant more than one. Blueberries are a unique crop in that the amount of viable seeds inside the fruit directly correlates to how large that fruit gets. They are somewhat self-pollinating, yes, but planting more bushes in close proximity is always going to result in higher yields and bigger berry size. And finally, on that same thought of fertilization, we have our third strategy. And that's our garden's best friend, pollinators. The focus on these guys is twofold. In one, making sure we not only have enough of these guys around, but two, that we also remove any barriers such as netting during the flowering phase of the blueberry plant. We need to let these guys through to do their thing because blueberry flowers don't last very long. Look, we could have a million blueberry bushes all nicely planted together, but without our friends the pollinators, that wouldn't do us any good. You know what will do us some good though? watching the next episode of the Garden Quickie. We grow a garden not only because it's tasty, but also to be a little more self-sufficient. And the only thing more self-sufficient than growing your own food is completing the whole life cycle of the crop from seed to harvest to seed without having to buy anything. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we all become a little more self-sufficient. And today's episode is all about seed saving. Or more accurately, my all time top five favorite crops to save seeds from. Time short as always, so let's get into it. Crop number one to save your own seeds from is lettuce. This nutritious powerhouse comes in four main growth types, but when the weather gets hot and dry, they all bolt and flower the same. Not only that, for the most part, lettuce is self-pollinating, making the seed collection a breeze. The second crop on my list for seed saving is tomatoes. A true garden heavy hitter, almost everyone grows tomatoes. Saving seeds off the ripe fruit is easy, but tomato seeds do need to be fermented first 
to get rid of their gelatinous coating. On top of that, make sure to only save heirloom tomatoes, as store-bought and hybrids are going to give you unknown results in the following season's fruit. Even though they're small, the seeds are mighty and they're long-lived. They'll store for up to five years or more. Coming in at number three, we've got peas. The real secret to saving your pea seeds is to leave those pods on the vine to dry for as long as possible. You really want those peas, which also happen to be the seeds, to dry out completely. The more dry they are, the better they're going to store and the more viable they're going to be at planting time. For a comprehensive tutorial on saving your own pea seeds, check out this video right here. Back to the nightshade family, we have peppers. Just like tomatoes, try to leave these guys on the plant for as long as possible for the most viable seed. After collection, dry the seeds out for two to three days and store them in a cool, dark place. And if you're saving seeds at the hots, do be careful. And lastly, rounding out my top five list of crops to save seeds from is green onions. This quick growing biennial plant often gets tricked into flowering and setting its seed in the first year, which is awesome because green onions are also one of the best pollinator attractors out there. At around midsummer, after seemingly flowering for months on end, the seed heads completely dry out, at which time you can shake them, getting loads of the shiny black seeds in the process. Just one seed head alone could provide you with hundreds of green onion seeds. Self-sufficiency through saving your own seeds. What could be better than that? Nothing. Except maybe watching the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Self-pollination. Open pollination. Complete flowers, incomplete flowers, stigma styles, pollen ovaries. It all sounds a bit risque for us simple gardeners. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we make gardening infinitely less complicated. And today's episode is all about self-pollination. What is it? Why do plants like these peppers do it? How do they do it? And what are the advantages? Time short as always, so let's get into it. The botanical definition of self-pollination in plants is the transfer of pollen from the anther of a flower to one or more stigmas on the same plant. Okay, that's a lot to decipher if you're not up on your biology and plant terminology, so let's break it down. Simply put, anthers and stigmas are just parts of a flower. The anther is the male part, and that's where pollen is formed and distributed, whereas the stigma is the receptive tip of the female part of the flower, and it receives the pollen in higher plants. Great, easy enough. Back to self-pollination. Most of our crops, including these peas here, have more than one flower on the plant. It's how we're able to get so much bounty. But not all flowers are the same, and they're divided into two main types, complete and incomplete. Complete flowers are the whole package. They contain anthers, stigmas, and all the male and female parts in each of their flowers. Incomplete flowers, on the other hand, as you may have guessed, contain only male or female parts. Now, self-pollination isn't picky. It can happen on both complete and incomplete flowers, but it's not as common as you may think. Take these carrot flowers here. Beautiful, complete flowers, but they lack the ability to self-pollinate. Now, self-pollinating makes it seem like our crops do all the work, but very few plants can actually self-pollinate without the aid of specific pollen vectors, i.e. wind or insects. But as a self-pollinator, these particular plants have specific advantages. First, they don't need to produce expensive nectars or smells to attract the pollinators. The genotypes are relatively stable in preferred environments. If resources are scarce, low numbers of flowers can still get the job done. And ultimately, they almost never waste pollen. Truly amazing stuff from some of our favorite crops. Know what else might be amazing? Hopefully the next episode of the Garden Quickie.
The importance of water in our gardens cannot be overstated. Without water, our crops and our plants will die. This much is obvious. But if there's not adequate moisture, especially right now, did you know that our soils can perish as well? Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we keep your plants and your soils healthy. And today's episode is all about moisture retention. Or, more accurately, how to increase the relative ability of your soil to grab onto water. I've got three easy ways to do it, time short as always, so let's get into it. The first method is probably something we already do, and that's to add more organic matter. Organic materials are the sponges that bind up water in our soil, making it available to the plant roots. Sand holds water for about three seconds, and clay is virtually water resistant. It's the ratio of organic matter content in your soil that dictates its water holding capacity overall. And the best way to increase it is just to add compost. By applying compost to our soils, we're not only adding valuable nutrients and minerals back into the garden, we're also adding pure organic matter. That's a double win. The second method to increasing water retention, and this one's non-negotiable, and that's to mulch. It's a simple fact of life that when something is covered, it loses a lot less moisture. The mulch on top of your soil is no different. The evaporative effects of heat, wind, and exposure are powerful. Together though, they can be devastating. Mulch protects your garden from all of those things. And covering an organic rich soil is gonna give you shockingly good moisture retention. Even on crazy hot summer days like this. And the third and final way to increase the moisture retention in your soil may seem counterintuitive, but it's to water less. Every time we water our gardens from above, we wash the soil of organic matter and microorganisms. The two main things that help to retain moisture. Water deeply and more thoroughly but less often, and train those roots to go downwards. You'll have more resilient plants in the process, but also a healthier soil. Know what else should give you a healthier soil? Quite likely the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Out of all the requirements and things a plant needs to grow, light's gotta be near the top of that list. But not all of our plants are the same. Just like us, each one has a preferred amount of sunshine that they'd like, while tolerating a range right around that level. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we break down all the gardening basics. And today's episode is all about the sun. More specifically, today we're gonna to explain what the terms full sun, partial sun, partial shade, and full shade mean. Time short as always, so let's get into it. On the back side of every seed packet, the good ones anyways, there's a whole host of information provided. And one of the key things they sometimes tell you is the plant's light requirements. These light requirements are always given as a minimum and they come in four different designations. First up is full sun, meaning the plant needs at least six to eight hours of direct unobstructed sun per day. Next, we have part sun, which designates plants that require only four to six hours of that same direct sun. Then we have part shade, which is often synonymous with the part sun. However, some designate this category for plants that actually require part shade, and they're not really tolerant of that direct midday sun. And lastly, we have full shade, and this is for plants that can't tolerate or in fact require less than four hours of direct sunlight per day. 
Again, noting that some of these plants actually don't like any of that midday sun at all. Because remember, not all sun is created equal. Direct sun in the early morning and direct sun at noon are two entirely different beasts. Not to mention, geography can play a huge part as well. The sun intensity where I live in Canada can be completely different to what plants experience in places like Texas and Florida. Always remember, the right plant for the right place. Sun or shade though, the right place for us to be is right here, watching the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Thanks for watching guys. And hey, if Garden Quickies are your thing, be sure to click on this playlist here as we explore and solve more growing issues in two minutes or less.